Oh, Lord. 
so I will He has done great things for me, so I will He has done great things for me, so I will He has done great things for me, so I will He has done great things for me 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 he has done great things for me. 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 So I will.
You know, sometimes people might wonder why we lift our hands in church. And we lift our hands as a sign of surrender. That God, we honor you and we surrender all to you. And that's why when we were singing, all my life you've been so faithful. What we're saying is, God, we surrender everything to you because you've been so faithful. If you want to just live a surrendered life, just lift your hands and worship him all over this place and say to him, all my life you've been so faithful, all my life. You've been so good. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have been faithful all my life. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I have made, oh, I will sing.
Is his goodness running after you? Come on, lift your hand. Go ahead and sing it. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. With my life laid down, with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness. and mercy follows us all the days of our life. No matter what you did yesterday, no matter what you did over the weekend, goodness and mercy. In fact, this morning, his mercies were brand new. New mercies this morning. Great is his faithfulness. How many of you can testify great is his faithfulness? That God has been faithful to you. He's been faithful to me. Even when we don't deserve it. He remains faithful because we are his children. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Nudge your neighbor and say, God's up to something good for you. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is a good, good God. And because of that, I will bless the Lord. Bless the Lord at all times. Amen. Do y'all remember what pastor's message was last Sunday? What was it? What to do when you're between a rock and a hard place? Y'all yeah, should remember this. And what, what you gonna do when unexpected things happen? Yeah, what do you do? What do you do when the unexpected happens? Yeah. I will bless the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good church answer. But what do you really do when unexpected things happen? Yeah. Is that what you really do? Or do you say, how am I going to get through this? I didn't see that coming. How many of you had an opportunity to use that message this past week? What it is, what you do. I know I did. We had, a, I said in the earlier service, we pastor preached that on Sunday. On Wednesday morning, our early learning center opens at like 7 a.m. And uh, our fir uh, first people to get over there went over. And one of, one of the staff members looked in the window and she in the door and said, that carpet's awfully shiny. And it was shiny because it was like under two inches of water. What do you do when your business is flooded with water? Get a boat. What do you do when you're backing out of a parking spot and somebody just slams into you? Yeah. What do you do? What do you do when the unexpected happens? Now y'all quiet. Because I'm talking about real life stuff. Do you curse? Uh, 
Real life. Real life. What do you do? So in his message, what did you tell us to do? What did he tell us to do when the unexpected happens? Say that, Sherry. Rise up, trust God. What's the third one? Oh, you might need to preach that one again because they don't know what to do when the unexpected happens. Well, we should bless the Lord also because that's going to get us through because all my life he's been faithful and always been so, so good, right? We know he's going to bring us through, right? Right, right, right. But that's real life. Right. Well, one of the things I said is that, number one, you got to rise up. Number two, you got to think up. And number three, you got to talk up. Mm -hmm. So you got to change your thinking and you got to talk differently. And sometimes I think sometimes people think that's a good church message, but how do I use that? You use it when you go out there in the world and things confront you. And the first thing you got to do is you got to rise up because it's easy to lay down and have a pity party. And pity parties won't get you out of your rut. You've got to get up. So, so I'll just be a little transparent. So that happened to me. I back, was backing out of a parking spot. My friend Carol was with, with me, and somebody, who's, who's, who's and I was driving, not my own car. I was driving his truck that Tell he really likes a lot. Tell him whose car you had. And somebody, somebody plows into me. Yeah. You know what I did? I held my peace, but I went home, and I got into bed for the rest of the day. Really? That's what I did. I didn't feel like he was fine. He, but he, you just got done speaking that morning, yeah. didn't you? Yep, not even an hour later. Yeah. And somebody just plows into me. Yeah. My truck. <laughs> and I had to tell him. She come I I come home and, and so she met me at the door. At the garage door. And she backed my truck in so I couldn't see it. <laughs> that was Lauren's idea. <laughs> So, she said, let's tell so, him before he so, sees it. So she backs my truck in, meets me at the door. Honey, I'll tell you what, it was some type of day today. And I'm thinking, why is she walking me to my car? <laughs> and she said, oh, by the way, you know, and then she told me what had happened. And I asked, was she okay? And uh, you handled that well. I thank you. You handled baby. that well. I thank you. But that's the unexpected. Thankfully, it was, it was, we didn't get hurt, Carol or, or I, we didn't get hurt, and it was minimal damage to his vehicle. You try hitting a Suburban with a bully on the back and see what happens. I'd be a bully. Other car wasn't too good, but yeah. unexpected things happen. It I'm does. talking real life. It does. It does. You know, we're Make not just singing these more. songs to sing these songs, mm -hmm. or he's not just giving a message when you're in church. Nope. We're talking about life, because y'all life be lifing. That's what the young people say. Things be happening. And we need tools, but we have to use the tools. So I'll be honest, I went home and I got into bed and I stayed there for about five hours. Yep. I was I needed to do that. When Lisa gets upset, she, she sleeps. She I sleep it off. That's my way. Uh, me, I work. I get busy yeah. doing stuff. But I was thankful that we didn't get hurt. Yep. You know, I was thankful. thankful when the, the ELC was flooded, you know, that it wasn't worse. It wasn't a weekend Fixable. where the water would have went all weekend long Fixable. running yeah. all weekend. Yeah. Just so you find what there is to be thankful for. Yeah. A lot of times we, we purpose, you heard of the 80, 20 rule, right? A lot of times we put our energy on the 80, 80, I mean, I'm sorry, on the 80, 20. 20. Thank you, Janine. Girl always got me on the 20 that's going wrong and not on the 80 percent that's going right yeah 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 we need to shift our focus a little bit right right, right? and focus right. on the the 80 that's good most of our lives is not 80 percent bad we might got some stuff going on in the 20 percent right? right well you know i i think it's an, it's important that um, things are fixable mm -hmm. and the enemy will make you think that it's permanent but things are fixable you know, and when you look at your situation, it might be something marital, it might be something in your body, it might be something in your family or with your relationships. But this is where we trust in the Lord and we don't lean to our own understanding. Because sometimes you don't fully understand why, where, and what is happening. But if you trust in God and understand that he's got you when you don't have yourself, sometimes you don't even have yourself. You ain't got it all together. You don't have all the answers. And that's where you have to literally say to yourself, Lord, 
I'm trusting you. Yes. Come on, let's try it. Lord, Lord I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. And you got me. If you believe he got you, give him some praise and thanksgiving for that. So, so for those of you, I just share two little things from our lives. For those of you who think the pastor's life and his family's life is peachy all the time, it's not. We got real stuff we deal with too, you know? And when he's preaching a message to you all, he's also it preaching it to himself. Well, I ate it before they did. Yeah, yeah. I ate it before they did. That's I'm good. the chef. You're the chef. You, I taste you the food. Taste I it. Taste Make the sure food. it's good. Yeah, I taste the you did a good job yeah, with that. You did a good job with that. <laughs> yeah. But can you attest that all our life, all my life, he's been faithful? Yeah, yeah. And so, so good. So with every breath that you're able, don't complain. Right. Sometimes we need to vent and get it out, but don't stay there. You know, and we'll sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I know you lost some money this week. How? Who's lost money? But you can get it back. Oh, just I know, I know, I know you've lost some money this. I know some some things didn't come through for you this week. But it's on the way. Look at your neighbor. Say it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And, and so sometimes we think God's always moving on our clock, and He's not. And you just have to smile as you walk through it. The fact that you were able to get up this morning, dress yourself, and brush your own teeth. He ain't done yet. He's not done yet. You know, and, and so just be thankful for where you are. Having done all to stand, stand there for. Don't look to the left or to the right. Look right on his word. He is faithful who has promised. He's got you. Your steps are ordered and directed by him. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Thousand will fall at your right hand and ten thousand at your left, but it won't come near you. His angels are encamped around about you. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is God round about his people. Keep on the whole armor of God, having the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girded about with truth, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace, and above all, take the shield of faith all the fire and darts of the wicked. God is working on your behalf behind the scenes. Some people you think you lost, but God dismissed them. I said some people you think you lost, but God dismissed them. You know, it's like flying a plane. God is the pilot. The Holy Spirit is the co-pilot. And what God has to do before he takes you to another level, he has to check the weight capacity. Some stuff was a weight that you thought was luggage. And so God had to keep it at the gate because he got to take you to another level. There are some things that did not get through TSA because God didn't want it traveling with you. So I know your heart is broken. I know you're disappointed. But where God is taking you, you're going to enjoy the journey. Can you say amen to that? It was the Bible says, laying aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you or distract you. I'm here to tell you, you think you lost them, but God dismissed them. They were not a part of your weight capacity. You thought they were an asset, but they were really a liability. And God had to dismiss them. I know it's hard right now, but sometimes you got to shout on purpose. I know I'm reading somebody's mail right now. And what you needed to hear was God dismiss them. So stop running after them. Do you understand that when Saul had messed up tremendously, he did what Samuel told him not to do. He stepped into an area that he wasn't supposed to step into. And God said to Samuel, Samuel was crying all night long for Saul. God spoke to Saul, 
Samuel, to the prophet Samuel. God spoke to the prophet Samuel. He said, get up and stop praying for him. I've already found David. You're crying about stuff that God wants you to move on past. You've been crying too many tears over stuff that God wants you to move on past. Now, I, I know you love them, and it was pure, and it was genuine, but they didn't reciprocate that. And it's time for you to wipe your tears and get your shout on. I said, get your shout on. I said, get your shout on. You need to take that in. I said you need to take that in. Because every time you have a down moment, you're crying. It's time for, for you to stop, turn to your neighbor, look them like this, and tell them stop crying. It's time for you to stop crying, and it's time for you to start shouting. says in Luke chapter 4 that the anointing will heal the brokenhearted. Now I understand, I understand they broke your heart. I understand that you invested and didn't get a return. But you're in an atmosphere where the anointing is here to put you back together again. And I'm here to tell you, what God has for you in your future, you don't even have an, a template or an example of anything in your past of what that looks like. Because you had joy before, but it wasn't the type of joy God wanted you to have. The Bible says that God will give us joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the joy God wants to give you is gonna be hard to articulate because it's gonna be different than anything you've ever experienced before. I know what I'm talking about. There's broken hearts that God wants to mend. And one of the ways he starts the process is when you worship, he pours in oil. That oil is the anointing that heals the broken heart. This is why you might come in tight, but don't leave tight. Leave light. <laughs> Can you say amen to that? Come on, lift your hands to heaven and give him praise. Thanksgiving and honor. God told Samuel, get up, get up, stop crying. He said, I found me a man. See, you up there crying, God already found you a man. Or a woman. Or a woman. You up there crying over Willie, Willie Wonka. I, I'm just trying to tell you, listen, I mean, <laughs> Do you understand that God's already on the other side of what you're still in? That's amazing to me. You know, I was just thinking, uh, we're, real soon we're going to Africa for a vacation. And when we go there, we'll be in your tomorrow. I'm going to call y'all and say, That's I'm in like your tomorrow. God. I know what it looked like. He's already in our future. Like, like if I call my kids at 6 o'clock in the morning, let's say uh, five o'clock in the morning where I am, they're home and they're 11 o'clock at night. I'm already in their future. I'm in the next day. I'm, you know, I, I, That's I, God. Lord, that he's in our future and he sees what it looks like. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. I might call them when we're in so Africa. I'm, I'm in your tomorrow. And it look real good. <laughs> that's really, that's really yeah. amazing. Wow, that, he could that, be. That, that, that is so incredible because I, I don't want to move too fast from what I know God is saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that you've been crying for too long over that. Stuff gets stuck in our emotions. We get stuck in our history. Your history is to be a lesson. You don't get stuck in your history. You learn from your history. And you've learned some things. You're wiser. You're smarter. And your level of selection should be even greater. But stop crying over that. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God can do better than your past? No, no, no. I, I, I want you to think about this. Do you think that God can do better than your past? Then why are you allowing your past to stop you from presently praising Him? See, if we really believe that God can do better than our past, then we'll get excited about our tomorrow. It takes faith to do that. And sometimes you got to tell your mind, that's why David said, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times, all that is in, within me, bless His holy name. And, and, and it says, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. When you boast in the Lord, that means you brag on how good He is. And sometimes, you know, the 80-20, as you were saying, we focus so much on that 20 that we allow it to stop us from praising Him for the 80. Yes. Yes. What we don't realize is what we think we lost, God was really, really, really rescuing you. People had the opportunity to encounter greatness when they encountered you. And they didn't appreciate it. And so because God has invested so much greatness in you, he didn't remove you, he removed them. And don't ever forget how much greatness is on the inside of you as a child of God. See, to a person who doesn't identify your worth, you will never be valuable to them. No, I want you to think about what I'm saying to you because I'm not just talking. To a person who doesn't identify your worth, you will never be valuable to them. And if you don't understand that, you will dummy yourself down to keep someone who doesn't see you as valuable. You will dummy yourself down. You will compromise your worth to keep someone who is worth less to you. And they don't see your value. And so what you've got to do as a man and a woman of God You've got to look into the mirror of God's Word and see how valuable you are and how great, how much greatness is on the inside of you and stop dummying yourself down. You've had some bad experiences. You've, you've hit the wall a couple times and some of it has been of your own making. But the very fact that you come to the house of God to honor Him today, I'm here to tell you that God honors that. And He has a way of taking our brokenness, putting it back together, anointing us, and then when people see us now, they're going to try to get with you, but you're going to have to tell them, you're still the same person, but I'm not. Now, I want that to sink in because, I, I, you know, you're thinking, what are you going to say next? No, I want you to get what I just said. You have more value than you realize. Your experiences do not define you. Your experiences are designed to be a lesson that you learn from. If you don't learn from those lessons, you're going to find yourself going back to Egypt, back to people God tried to dismiss out of your life, but you went and put them in the seat and put the seatbelt on them to keep them. And God has something greater for you. You understand what I'm saying to you? He has something greater for you. Tell your neighbor, God has something greater for you. He has something greater for you. Tell him again, he has something greater for you. Yeah. That's really good. 
That's really good. He gave us like two sermons, and that's no, not even. I'm, his, no, I'm no, that's good. No, it's good but, stuff. But, but I, I don't want you to look at it as a sermon. I want you to see it as an exhortation from the Lord, because it becomes a rhema word to you if you'll grab a hold yes, of it, yes. and that word can transform some things for you. God is speaking directly to some people in this room today about some areas of their life that they've been wondering why is this person not there? I thought they were always going to be there. I thought this was the one or she was the one. And what God is saying, I've got something better for you. You've compromised yourself. You've dummied down yourself. You did things you never thought you would do for the sake of trying to keep something that God was trying to dismiss. And now that he's dismissed it, sure you have the memory and the pain of the hurt of the past, and even the good memories sometimes can haunt you. But he can do better than that. And you've got to be convinced of that. He can do better than that. He can do better than that. And so get ready for it. Can you say amen to that? Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. He dismissed them to rescue you. To rescue you. I, I remember very clearly I remember very clearly I was dating a young lady and I broke up with her and I had the guy who led me to the Lord in the car we was in his y'all remember the car called a Renault y'all remember those little cars called Renault y'all don't remember them I remember I was well that was they, they don't make them no more <laughs> but I remember sitting in the car and uh, I was sitting in the back seat and I was telling him what had happened. And she broke up with me. And I cried. I cried. Because I liked her. I cried, man. I cried real hard. And uh, as I was crying, you know how you cry so long and so hard, and then all of a sudden you start laughing? <laughs> it was one of those type of cries. And I remember him saying to me when I started laughing, he said, brother, he said, God's releasing you from that. Because it was in my emotions. You know how you get those relationships and they get in your emotions? Uh, y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I said, you remember those type of relationships? They get in your emotions? When you're by yourself, you think about the walks in the park. And uh, so she broke up with me. And I'm so glad. I said, I'm so glad. I'm so glad, I'm so, I'm so glad, because I would have missed out on 40 years of this. You understand what I'm saying to you? At that moment, it was hard and it was difficult. I'm not telling you something that's easy. I'm not telling you something that's not going to be painful. But I'm here to tell you, God had better for me. Nothing wrong with her. Nothing wrong with her. She just wasn't the one. And God knew it would work for me. I See, I don't need somebody behind me. I need somebody beside me. You see? This is my rib. I only got one. I don't have any spare ribs. You understand? Boy, I can mess with that spare rib thing. Boy, I ain't gonna mess with it. Girl. But, but, but you understand, sometimes things can be painful. And I know I'm taking time, but I know when the Spirit of God and when it's not. There are things that get stuck in our emotion that can be hard to let go of. And I can tell you that when I went through that season of my life, one of the things I never did was disconnect from the house of God. And so many times we go AWOL, we go missing in action and not realize that this is the only place that the anointing will flow and put you back together again. And when we have these opportunities to worship, you worship as if it's only you and God in the room. Don't worry about the people around you. I mean, if they ain't worshiping, they probably in the wrong place too. So you need to worship God like it's just you and him so that he can pour in the oil and heal those broken areas of your life. Can you say amen to that? Why don't you just lift your hands and give him praise and thanksgiving and you can go ahead.
I'll be quiet. You ask me to come up here. You know. Yeah, Scott is good, isn't he? It's funny because sometimes I like him to come up with me, and I said, you want to come up with me? And he said, no. I said, well, come on up with me. He said, okay, but I'm not going to say anything. I was like, <laughs> I, I, I was like Jeremiah was going to keep it to myself, but his word was like fire shot up in my bones. So I got to say what he tells me to speak. So I will sit down right now. I'll come up, but I'm not going to say anything. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't even have to, I, I just know he can't help it. Because he's going to speak what the Lord says to say. I can. <laughs> amen, amen. Well, that was, they were great exhortations. Y'all go back and li li listen again and again, because a lot was said. God dismissing people from our lives. Because sometimes we don't excuse them. God has to dismiss them. Like, we could excuse them, like, okay, it's over, but sometimes we don't do that, and he has to dismiss them. Amen? Amen. Well, let's hear it for our praise team. Ben, thank y'all. Great job today. Great, great job. We all been standing for a long time. Say hi to your neighbor, greet somebody, and then go ahead and be seated. Yes. Amen. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Well, welcome. We know you already feel welcome. You sense the spirit of God here already. Welcome those of you who are viewing online. God is good, isn't he? We welcome you. If you're viewing online, drop it in the comments. Let us know where you're viewing from. We'd love to know that, okay? How about last Sunday? We had a great time here celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. It was just awesome. I think last Sunday was, our, in terms of attendance, was our biggest Sunday ever in 24 years. It's absolutely awesome how many lives were touched. I was talking to uh, my, my grandkids were over last night, and I hadn't talked to them for a little bit, and my oldest granddaughter, Saray, said, Bibi, she said, church was so good on Sunday. It was so good. I said, you enjoyed it? She said, we had a play upstairs. And she said, it was wonderful. This is her talking, just talking. It was so good, and my friends were in it, and she was just so excited. So let's hear for all the participa participants upstairs. You're making a difference. It was memorable for her. You know, a week later, she's still talking about it. And then all of the teams who served last week, you served so well. I'm not going to start naming, but anybody who served last week, just outstanding. We touched lives last week. Yes. Oh, do you know how many kids they had up there last Sunday? They average around 140, 140 kids. Last Sunday was 242 kids. 242 kids. I believe they had about 75 workers. Isn't that great? Some churches aren't 242 adults. We had 242 children. Y'all need to go visit some other churches and see what's happening in other places. You'll see that's not happening everywhere. That was huge. It was tremendous. And they handled it well. They handled it well. So it was, it was just a great day all the way around. I'm going to share just a few announcements with you. I really need you all to use those QR codes and go and um, check out our website because because of time I'm not going to be able to hit every everything. I do want to let you know, I failed to mention it in the early service, we will not be having healing school on this coming Thursday. No healing school on this Thursday. I want you to know that. Um, do, is Chad or one of the representatives from the uh, bridge here this morning? Uh, yeah, come on up. They're going to give us another announcement. If you're between the ages of 19 and 29, stand up. Let's see who you are. Oh, wow. Let's stand up. Keep standing for a moment. Come on up, y'all. They got something for y'all on Saturday night here, okay? All right. Tell them about it. Good morning, Seeds. Good morning. We can do better than that. Good morning, Seeds. 
I'm here to let y'all know that the bridge was under a little bit of con under construction, but uh, it's back up and running. So we are gonna kick it off with a game night that's gonna take place this Saturday, right here at Seeds in the gym, April 13th. We gonna have food, we gonna have game. This is the time where y'all supposed to be pulling out y'all phones and using the QR code to sign up. So don't wait right now, um, but use the QR code. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a time to fellowship with people in your age range. Again, that 19 to 29 uh, after service will be out in the fellowship hall if you guys have any questions and I'm gonna kick it over free 99 um, some of y'all know what that means free 99 y'all don't got to pay anything food drinks music game it's gonna be a lot of fun Amber yes I also want to include that some people were asking like what if I have children what if I can't provide childcare that night am I able to bring my kids yes you are welcome to bring your children it's a game night we want to have fun so of course they are welcome some people also ask, like, what if I'm not a member? What if I didn't take the new members class? You are also welcome to come to, and we hope that with our event, you will think about having seats be your home. So we see you guys there. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So some good stuff, good stuff. Uh, let's see, uh, Latanya, come on up. Uh, we have our healthcare team is doing a uh, community health fair. So uh, Latanya's gonna come up, gonna tell you a little bit about it. It's on Saturday the 20th. It's another free event. We've been talking about the natural side of healing uh, over the month of March, and we hear a lot about the spiritual side, but there are some things we need to do in the natural. So we're having this health fair to help our members in the community learn more about what goes on on the natural side. So thank you. Good morning, Seeds. So um, as um, uh, we're really excited, our healthcare team is having our annual community health fair, April 20th, Saturday, April 20th from 9 to 1 uh, p.m. So, you know, our healthcare team, we're not just here to be available for, um, you know, incidents or emergencies. We have a commitment to you and to the community to provide awareness, uh, information about wellness, and prevention, and one of the ways that we're doing that is having our healthcare fair. Um, so I want to just share some of the resources that we have. One of our nurses is actually a masseuse, so she's actually going to have on-site massage chair there available for us. We're going to have vision screening as well as glasses display, breast cancer. Actually, I'm going to say cancer awareness. I'm an oncology nurse practitioner. And my motto is all cancers matter. So we're gonna have cancer awareness, diabetes education, information on nutrition and weight management, hands-on CPR demonstration, an MP, a family nurse practitioner would be on site for um, some of our early parenting and um, support resources. Um, and we're also, one of my favorites is the five wishes document. If you do not know what that is, you need to come and be informed, okay? We'll have activities for the children. We'll have much, much more. We'll have a lot of giveaways. Um, Sister Lisa, we have been uh, promoting this on the radio, Facebook. If you get something on Facebook, like and share it. But um, so the community is aware. But we want our Seeds family here. We want you to be aware. We want you to know about prevention. And we want you to have um, more health literacy. So please come out. So, Latanya, you are a nurse practitioner? She's an oncology nurse practitioner with her doctorate. This is the kind of expertise that we have here in our church that want to serve you to make you more aware. A lot of times we think we can just pray everything away, and prayer is wonderful. We are advocates of prayer, but there are some things that we have to do. And so they're going to be sharing some really valuable information on that day and you don't want to miss it bring your neighbors bring you don't have somebody said this morning you don't have to stay the whole time you can drop in anytime between nine and one and get the information and share it okay it's so valuable thank you appreciate you all doing this let's see ebi that's our entrepreneurs business institute they're doing an event coming up on the 16th of um this month and it's called Acquiring Business Funding. 
Okay, the presenter is our very own Jessica Brokenball, who uh, was previously a loan and technical assistance officer. So she has lots of experience where financing your business and, you know, getting it uh, started from the ground up. So that's Tuesday the 16th at 545. You can get your ticket in the bookstore, bookstore $10 per person, and you can register by texting that code. So take a picture of that and you can do that uh, later. And then a lot of these uh, groups that are hosting these events, they'll be in the fellowship hall afterwards. We have a special event coming up for our widows and widowers. So you don't want to miss any of this. I'm not going to go into much more detail. I do want to let you know something else though that, um, that happened recently with one of our families. Um, the Osbournes, Jim and Brenda Osborne, their daughter Corinne, um, has a son, Aaron, Aaron Bell, and Aaron uh, died after being in a, uh, I said a car crash this morning, that wasn't right, he, he had a, a heart attack, I don't know, I was thinking of the other, um, but he was 37 years old, and that is young for that to happen to, so we're going to be celebrating Aaron's life this Thursday, um, here at Seeds of Greatness, there's going to be a viewing from 9 to 10, and then 11 o'clock. Um, the, at 10 o'clock is the service. So if you're available, come out and show this family some love. The Osbournes have been with us here at Seeds almost from day one, almost from day one, and um, moved to North Carolina, came back, and came back to Seeds. And it, they're just an awesome family. They come in here three generations, I mean, four generations deep, all of them, 30, 40 of them at a time. It's beautiful to see. So we want to support them. I see some of them in the service this morning, and um, ju we just want to love on them and support them uh, this week. Also, uh, I want to give a big shout out to those who run and organize our basketball league. They had a banquet here on Friday night. <laughs> Lou and Serge and their whole team, they're, they're somewhere around here, but they have done a, just a great job over the years um, of promoting this basketball league, touching kids in the community. It was outstanding. They had this uh, banquet closing out the season on Friday. It was great, wasn't it, honey? Chad, who just spoke, um, came up here. He was one of the speakers. They recognize uh, different ones. Herman Boick, who's been a referee from the beginning and doesn't really miss a game recognized him, and then to close it out, they did something I thought was so special, um, something God put on Lou's heart. Uh, we told y'all over the last few weeks about Damian Ross Jr., you know, dying as a result of being in a terrible car accident. Damian came through our basketball league, and uh, I see, I think I just saw his parents there. Stand up, guys. Lou closed it out by letting our folks know that going forward, the most valuable player award is going to be done in Damian Jr.'s name. So it'll be the Damian, Damian Jr., uh, Damian Ross Jr., most valuable player award. He will never be forgotten, guys. Never, ever be forgotten. And to see the look on their faces when Lou announced that was just priceless and, and just another way of letting you know the kind of impact that your son has made and will continue to make. Amen? Amen. I love our church. I love our church. All the ideas don't have to come through Pastor Jerome and I. Our folks, because there's greatness in all of us. And thanks for sharing that greatness with us. Um, you want to celebrate a birthday or two? Anybody have a birthday in April? Baby. Your baby, yes. Turn seven. Turn seven, all right. Anybody else stand up if you got a birthday? Yes, thank you, Jason. So if your birthday is this month, celebrate all month. Every time you go out for lunch or dinner or breakfast, tell them it's your birthday. They'll probably give you something free. And if they don't say, when I was at uh, Firebirds, they gave me something free for my birthday. So go, go out the whole month. Milton, sing to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.
birthday, y'all. Keep celebrating. It's great to have a birthday. You should be glad you have a birthday. You know, you should be glad. Anybody have an anniversary this month? Wedding anniversary? Stand up if you have a wedding anniversary this month. Wonderful. Wonderful. You want to come up and share a tip with us if you have a wedding anniversary this month? Yeah, come quickly. Share a tip. Tell us how you've been able to stay married because everybody don't. All right. All right. Elder Jerry Foster, we'll start with you. Come on over. So when is your anniversary? Uh, the 5th. The 5th? Of, <laughs> yeah. It was the 5th. It was the 5th. Yeah. yeah. How many years? 21 years. 21 years. <laughs> is your bride serving? She's upstairs serving. So t give us a tip. Um, always keep your promise. Before we got married, one day we were talking and she said something about, I said something to her about driving and how to drive. And she said she didn't know how to do that. So I said, don't worry about it. You don't ever have to drive. You just sit there and look pretty. <laughs> 21 years later, I'm still driving Miss Daisy. That's good. And you probably don't complain about it, do you? You don't complain? Listen, I, the other night at our, um, the other night at, at our marriage boot camp, we talked about uh, opening the door. Remember, I was talking about my husband opening the door and not opening the door. And my husband's been opening the door for me, the car door, ever since. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was I, I thought that was pretty special. Come on over, guys. So, when is your anniversary? April seventeenth. Awesome. April seventeenth. How many years? Three. Three years. I like those glasses. They are so cute. Give us a tip. Intentional communication. Sometimes when we're having a conversation, I may say something and he interprets it in a different way and I have to come back and say, well, what did I just say? And he'll repeat it and it's not what I said. <laughs> That's the way he heard it. So you gotta be more intentional about how you communicate. Because sometimes you could say something and people hear it differently, right? And it's good to repeat back what was said. That way you make sure they got it. Awesome, awesome. So I'm gonna piggyback on that. Um, I have to be uh, open to an interpretation because um, it's always something coming at us. So I have to interpret what she say and um, interpret what other people say. Awesome, awesome. I love their story. Y'all may not know their story, but both of them, um, their spouses moved to heaven. Different times, right? Different times, Amanda first and then your hubby. Uh, years, a few years later, and they found love again here at Seeds. And I just, I just love it. Just love it, love it, love it. Happy anniversary. Three years. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Debbie. My uh, wedding anniversary, we just celebrated April the 5th. Oh. And my husband's usually here with me. He wasn't feeling good this morning. And we celebrated 45 years of marriage. We, we have been together for 50 years. Wow, that is great. So what's a tip from you? Don't discuss the D word. Keep the D word out of your vocabulary. We learned that. So diamonds? Divorce, mm -hmm. divorce, we- Keep diamonds in. Yes, keep, keep diamonds in. And we learned that at, when we were married for five years and we were having a humongous argument. 
and we woke up and we argued and he stormed out the door and I slammed the door and the glass shattered and then he came back and he said, oh yeah, and by the way, happy fifth anniversary. And from that, that day- was on your anniversary? It was on, we didn't even realize it was wow. on our anniversary. And from that day, uh, when we were celebrating, we recognized that we didn't even cherish mm -hmm. the fact that we had been still together for five years. You know, so you took the, the D word divorce off the table. Off it's not something table. to be discussed. Yep, yep, not exactly. something to be discussed. Because I was like, you can leave and I want a divorce and didn't even realize it was on our anniversary. So yeah. Okay. And Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Thank you. That's so good. So, how many years for you guys? We are six on the 28th. Awesome. <laughs> Just had their first baby. So, um, when we got married, I thought that two Christians coming together was a Christ-centered marriage, and I actually thought that naively for a few years, and I'm like, what's going on? What, what, why does it have this feel right? And I learned that we had to cultivate Christ-like habits in our marriage. Mm -hmm. So how we view each other, talk to each other, pray with each other, pray for each other, really cultivating the, those attributes in marriage, not just coming together and thinking it's going to magically happen. So. That's really, so cultivate Christ-like behavior in your marriage. I love that. Love that. Um, and I think for me, it's uh, learning how a part of leading in our marriage is knowing when to submit. Um, and doing it, in, particularly in the difficult times. But you mean a man has to submit? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I thought the wife had to submit. No, that's, that's part of leadership in, in, in marriage, and that's what I found has been effective in our marriage as well. Awesome, yep. awesome. I think we got another singer. He's, he's reaching out for the microphone. You gonna sing like your daddy? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Like, one of the things I like, some, sometimes I just like to expound a little bit on different ones, but one of the things I like about this, love about this couple is God moved them, you may have heard a little bit of accent, God moved them from the Bahamas to Seeds. Not, well, to Delaware, but I, I say he moved y'all for Seeds. But isn't that cool? Like Ian's a pastor's kid. He's a PK, been doing worship for years. And God moved, who leaves the Bahamas? I don't know that I, I would do if God said do it. Huh? That's right, God said. God said do it. They both work for Bank of New York? JP J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan. Both work for J.P. Morgan. God, four months of paternity leave, both of them. Maternity, paternity. Isn't that awesome? Love it. So they can love on this precious baby. God bless y'all. Thank you for sharing. Six years on the 28th. All right. I'm done. I'm going to sit down. Okay, sit down, Lise. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen? Amen? We're so glad you're here, and we're so glad for those of you that are viewing online. So thankful for the faithfulness of God. Uh, we're going to prepare to receive the morning tithes and offering. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you're a guest here today, you don't have to participate in the offering if you so choose. If you're a member of Seeds of Greatness, we want to encourage you to be a tither and an offering giver. We believe that that's the biblical principles that God has established in His Word. There's three easy ways you can give here. You can give by an envelope. The ushers will assist you through cash, check, or your debit card. You can give mobily uh, by your phone. The information's on the screen. Or you can give online at seedsofgreatness.org. We believe that our giving is an opportunity and a privilege to honor God. The Bible says that in Proverbs chapter 3. It says, honor God with your substance and with the first fruit of all of your increase. And that's talking about your, your income. I believe that every child of God should be a tither and an offering giver. Amen. Tithing and offerings are our way of showing our appreciation to God for what he's done in our lives. And how many of you can testify that God has done great things in your life? <clears throat> yeah. And this is, this is our way of honoring him. Does God get your money? Absolutely not. What he gets is your obedience and your attitude. That's what he gets. He gets your obedience and your attitude. And so as you give, the Bible says, let every man give as he has purposed in his heart. That means you should make the decision on what and how you're going to give before you come to church so no one can put pressure on you to make you feel like you're being forced to give anything. Don't ever let anyone 
force you to give anything. The Bible says give cheerfully and, and from a cheerful place, and that's a place of thanksgiving. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Giving is also a reflection of our heart and our attitude towards God. And as we do that, the Bible says God will cause men to give unto us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's the type of blessing that God has in store for us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Why don't you stand with me as we pray, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the great mighty one, the Holy Spirit, who is our helper and our guide. Holy Spirit, we depend on you to lead us, to guide us. Every aspect of this service is under your control. We bind confusion on every hand, and we thank you, Father, for peace. We thank you for direction, and we thank you for your wisdom. Father, I ask you to bless each and every person that gives today, those in the, in the sanctuary and those online. And God, we ask you to increase them more and more, both them and their children. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to cause us all to be blessed, to be a greater blessing to everyone we come in contact with. In the name of Jesus, Father, we honor you. We give you praise, glory, and honor and thanksgiving. In Jesus' holy name, say it, I am blessed. I am blessed. To be, to be a blessing. Look at your hands. Father, I pray that everything that their hands touch, God, you would cause it to prosper and to increase. Whether it be their children, whether it be their place of employment, whether it be themselves, that God, you would cause them to increase and prosper and to be strong in their minds and in their bodies. Father, we thank you today for the wisdom of Solomon, the courage of David, and the insight of Joseph. Father, I thank you for a supply of the Spirit, Father, that will cause me to be able to be your mouthpiece. Father, anything that needs to be known, anything that I need to see, Father, anything I need to be reminded of, I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit, to give me clarity of thought and utterance. And I thank you, Father, for confirming the word with signs and wonders following. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the church say amen. amen. The information is on the screen. Before you are seated, turn to your neighbor, just one of them, and say, you're not breaking down. You're not, breaking down. You're not falling apart. You're not falling apart. And you better not give up. And you better not give up. God, is God is with you. God is for you. God is for you. You will not be shaken. You will not be moved. You are resilient. You adapt, you adapt to challenges. You adapt to difficulties. You adapt to difficulties. And you bounce, you bounce back to life difficulties. You are strong. You are strong. I, call you strong. I call you strong. You are blessed. You are blessed. I, call you blessed. I call you blessed. You are healthy. You are healthy. I, call you healthy. I call you healthy. I say you have the wisdom of God. I say you, have the wisdom of God. you have the mind of Christ. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You're smart. You're, smart. You're, useful. You're useful. You're likable. You're likable. You, are you are powerful. I call you strong. I call you redeemed. You have wisdom beyond your years. You are sharp in your mind. You are strong in your spirit. You are strong in your body. You are a doer of what you hear. You are, you, are what you, hear. you are the head only, the head only. And, not the tail. and not the tail. You have faith. Have faith. Your, faith your faith is in God. He orders your steps. Orders your steps. You, are you are filled with the knowledge of His will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. All wisdom and spiritual you know what to do. You know how to do it, and you know when to do it. The favor of God is on your life. In Jesus' name, this week, I believe that you will have upgrades, advancements, promotion, special treatments, preferential treatments, in the name of Jesus. Because the greater one is in you, you cannot be defeated. Because the greater one is in you, 
you will not be overcome. The greater one empowers you. The greater one strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, give the Lord a shout of praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it with me. My faith is not fragile. Why y'all sitting there? Why y'all sitting there? Why y'all sitting there? What y'all doing? I think this is intermission. This ain't a popcorn break. Come on. My faith is not fragile. My faith is not weak. My faith gets stronger every time I speak. My body's not fragile. My body is not weak. My body gets stronger every time I speak. Put your hands on your wallet or your pocketbook. Say, my finances are not fragile. My finances are not weak. My finances increase every time I tithe. Give God praise for that. You may be seated. Yeah. You can be seated. Some of y'all gonna sit down anyway, huh? You thinking, you know what? This ain't a robust class. Okay, I get it, get it, get it. You know, I was going through my notes in my office, and I have a whole lot of notes, binders, books, over these forty plus years of sermons and things that the Lord has spoken to me, and things that He's spoken to my heart. And I came across a little piece of paper, and on it, I, it has at the top, "Do you seriously think God can't use you?" Do you seriously think that God can't use you? Turn to your neighbor and ask them that. Do you seriously think God can't use you? <clears throat> and I, I, I have a list of people. This is not my sermon, but I have a list of people. It says that Noah was a drunkard. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was fearful. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. Sansom was a womanizer. David had an affair and killed the husband. Elisha was suicidal. Jonah tried to run from God. Peter was a sword swinger and a cusser. Got some of them in the church. Um, and... Uh, Thomas was a doubter. Turn to your neighbor and say, God can use you. God can use you. Amen? Amen? You know, January the 14th, we started a series here by the direction of the Lord, talking about the power and the importance of forgiveness. And honestly, I don't think you could ever talk too much about forgiveness. It's so many different layers to forgiveness. I think Jesus epitomized forgiveness when he was on the cross, an innocent man, nailed to the cross naked. Most of the time we see pictures of him with a little uh, uh, covering on, but the Bible says they took his garment and they, they, they rolled dice for his garment. He was naked. And uh, on that cross, an innocent man died. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And forgiveness is something that you and I are not given the option to do. We are commanded to forgive. When something is a command, that means if you don't do it, there are consequences involved. And so when God tells us to forgive, it didn't say that forgiveness is a feeling, because you won't always feel like forgiving people who have abused you, who have hurt you, <clears throat> who have violated you. You won't feel like that. But you forgive by faith, regardless of how you feel. And you forgive by saying, Father, I forgive them, I release them, I pardon them from what they did to me. But understand that there's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness is a decision. Trust is a process. I can forgive you for stealing from me. But I don't have to trust you with my wallet. And you can forgive a person, but it doesn't mean that you have to openly, immediately trust them. Because trust has to be earned. Can you say amen to this? Amen. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes down to your children. 
You can forgive them of, of something that they've done. But that trust has to be re-established re, uh, in the relationship. Can you say amen to this? And so as we think about this today, you know, uh, I, I think that this will tie right into this. I want to look at something today that I believe is going to help us all. Uh, Jason, if you guys will bring that table up, that will be uh, great right now. Because I want you to open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Proverbs 27, verse 17. I want you to bring it up on your phone or on your apparatus that you have. It's very important that you acquaint, acquaint yourself with the scriptures, whether it's on your phone. I know we put them up on the screen, but it's important that you know these scriptures because I'm not preaching a sermon just to fill a Sunday. I'm trying to give you some tools to put in your toolbox so that when you walk out the door, you have something in your arsenal to stand against what's going to come at you. Can you say amen to this? Are you all awake this morning? Do you need to stand up, do some calisthenics, jumping jacks or something? You good? All right. So I want you to open your Bible, Proverbs chapter 27, just one verse, verse 17. I'm going to be reading from a few different translations of the Bible. The reason why I do that is because I want you to walk away with an understanding of the Scripture. I don't just want you to know the Scripture, but I want you to understand the context of what the Scripture is talking about. It says, iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The New Living Translation says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. The Passion Bible, It takes a grinding wheel to sharpen a blade. And so one person sharpens the character. Somebody say character. One person sharpens the character of another. The Amplified Classic says, <clears throat> iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends to show rage or worthy purpose. In the Message Bible I like, you can use steel to sharpen steel, and one friend sharpens another. I want you to see the importance of association. Who you associate with has an impact on you as an individual. My parents used to always tell me that when I was growing up as a kid, that they didn't want us running around with certain people or be around certain people because they didn't want us to get in trouble because they knew the character of the people. I didn't get that when I was younger, but I got it now. That the people you run with has a direct impact on molding and shaping your character. They will either make you better or they will make you bad. And sometimes as a young person, maybe sometimes even as an adult, you have to be careful of who you run with, who you practice with, who you hang out with, who you socialize with. Because the people that you run with, this is a metaphor, people can help you to improve or people can hurt you and make you bad. Now when it says iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend, sometimes the sharpening in our lives doesn't just come from good people. Sometimes bad people can make you better. I said, sometimes bad people can make you better. Sometimes when bad people talk about you, they'll make you pray in ways you ain't never prayed. <laughs> it's like, I thought I knew Jesus, but I need a whole nother Jesus to get through this. Because people that hurt you, people that abuse you, they will either push you from God or they will push you on your knees to seek God. So I want to look at this from a, a little different slant this morning, that a lot of times when we think of iron sharpening iron, we just think of good people helping us to get better. 
But do you know that sometimes God can use your enemies? That God can use your haters to make you better? And this is one of the challenges that I'm going to put to you today that sometimes the people that are hating on you big time, they don't even realize that God is using them to push you and make you better. When I played football, there were people that had more time on the team than me, had more experience than me, and were bigger than I was. And the thing is that they did, they didn't realize, is that they pushed me because I wanted what they had, so it pushed me to get better. You need to hang around people that make you better. I said, you need to hang around people that make you better. That means that sometimes you're going to have to hang around people that know more than you, that are more successful than you, and sometimes the people you hang around will intimidate you to get better. Hang around people that talk with a higher level of articulation than you, that use different words than Ebonics than you. When I was younger, I used to carry a little pocket dictionary around with me in my pocket because people would say words and I didn't want to say, what you talking about, Willis? I didn't want, I didn't want them to know. I didn't know. But I would pull out my pocket dictionary by myself and look the word up so that I could understand what they were saying to me. And then the next time I was talking to somebody, I'd use that word and people say, where'd you get that word from? Well, you know, brother growing, you know what I mean? But they were pushing me. And every day as a child of God, you want to strive to do better. You don't ever want to plateau and be, be comfortable with where you are. Sure, you can quote two verses, but work on quoting the whole chapter. Constantly push yourself. Read a book. Do something that's going to push you and make you better. But I've got to tell you that it's not always going to be fun, and it's not always going to be easy. The scripture says iron does what? Sharpen. Come on, talk to me. Iron does what? Sharpen. Iron sharpens iron. Did you notice that it didn't say that uh, iron sharpens wood? Wood doesn't sharpen iron. And sometimes we hang around people like this. Just a solid block head of wood. We hang around people like this. And right now, you know their face came to you, didn't it? But this doesn't do anything. This doesn't sharpen wood. In fact, one of the ways to determine who's wood, because wood's not good. It will make you dull. Who are the people that you're trying to sharpen yourself with and they're making, they're making you dull. You can come with enthusiasm after this wonderful service and say, God was moving. He spoke a word to me. And you get around them and they say, yep. <laughs> you know who those blockheads are? You know who those pieces of wood are? They come in heavy, but ain't nothing to them. You're not going to be able to sharpen yourself on people who are wood. Wood is no good to sharpen yourself on. It didn't say that iron is sharpened by... Now, now when I was coming up as a kid, some of y'all know what I'm about to say. We lived in the project. We didn't have those elaborate knife things you put in there and just pull it through. Mom said, go on the back porch and sharpen that knife. We'd be back there. You might have thought we was Ginsu Chinese guy just cutting it. You know what I mean? You know how they do it. You su What's that restaurant that they... Uh, buy, uh, let me show you what they do. No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I got the whole church's attention right now. See? But, but they, you know... You know what happens? It chips your blade. You need to know the people that are chipping you up. 
They're not sharpening you. But then it says iron sharpens iron. Let's see here. One of the things about this here piece of metal, in order for me to get the optimum out of it, I had to put some oil on it. There's a certain sound that sounds good. It's different from hitting on that wood. It's different from hitting that block head. I mean that piece of cement there. But there's... Now here's the thing you need to understand and never forget this. In order for me to get my edge back, it's going to require pressure and friction. And one of the things we run from, we want to be sharp, we want to get our edge back with God, but when it comes down to pressure, we avoid it. When it comes down to friction, we don't want no friction. If it's friction, it can't be God, but, but how are you going to get your edge back? I'm putting pressure, and there's friction. And the reason why I'm not losing my edge but getting sharper is because I put some oil there to lubricate it. Well, you're going to experience the same thing. If you are going to be sharpened going into this year, these next few months, you're going to experience some friction. You're going to experience some pressure. And my message to you today is, who's rubbing you the wrong way? Because we want to run from everything and everybody who's rubbing us the wrong way. And I'm here to tell you that it's a part of your sharpening. Because iron sharpens iron. Sometimes it's family members. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know it's in this room. People that rub you the wrong way. Sometimes it's co-workers. Sometimes there are people who are job hoppers. Job hoppers. As soon as they experience some friction and pressure, I'm out of here. And they leave. Not realizing that even that pressure and, 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 and friction that you're experiencing is a part of your part of your sharpening. And I know it's not pleasant, I know it's not fun, but I'm here to tell you, you'll never get your edge back if there's no pressure and friction. Sometimes the people that is rubbing you the wrong right way is sitting on your pew right now. Just keep looking forward, keep looking forward. To it. Some of them are sitting in the church with you. And because of the friction, because of the pressure, you come to the 1030 service and you pray to God, they go to the 8. <laughs> because of pressure. Sometimes that, that person who's rubbing you the wrong way is your children. Sometimes it's your parents. But I'm here to tell you that God wants you to experience the pressure and he wants you to experience the friction. I know you're probably thinking, this is not the message I need to hear today, Pastor. But I'm here to tell you from the scripture. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Amen. Let me break it down to you. One translation says, in this world, you're going to have pressure. You're going to have difficulty. He says you're going to have it. So all I'm trying to do is get you to understand that the difficulty and the pressure is a part of life. You're not going to get out of here without it. You're going to experience the friction. You're going to experience the pressure. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure. But he says something along with that. Be of good cheer. What does that mean? Have the right attitude when you're dealing with friction, when you're dealing with pressure. Keep the right attitude. Nudge your neighbor and say, keep the right attitude. Yeah. 
Now you got to shout it at them. Keep the right attitude. Keep the right attitude. Because you're not going to get through this world without it. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. In this world, you're going to have persecution. In this world, you're going to have difficulty. But be of good cheer. See, what you don't realize is that in the midst of this, you are being sharpened. God is wanting you to get your edge back. Do you understand that if I spend all of my time with this, it's going to make me dull? You might say, well, Pastor, why do I need to get my edge back? Because there are things you are going to face this year that if you don't have your edge back, you're not going to cut through it. You're not going to cut through it. There are things that has come at least and I, and it wasn't be, if, it, if it had not been for us to understand the process, we would have never got through to the other side. Sure, there's friction. Sure, there's pressure. But one of the things we did is we made a decision to keep our feet planted on the Word and in the house of God. And as a result of that, when the winds of life, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, if I remember correctly, he said two men were building a house. He said the storm hit both houses, the, it hit both men's house. Isn't that something? So no one was exempt from the storm. No one escaped the storm. No one escaped the winds. No one escaped the rain. No one escaped the flood. No, nobody escaped that. You know what I've learned about pain? It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't make a difference what your financial background is. I mean, the king is dealing with cancer. To the wino down on 5th Street is dealing with cancer. It doesn't make a difference. So we're going to experience the storm. We're going to experience the rain. We're going to experience the difficulty and the setback. I'm here to tell you, Jesus said this through uh, the apostle Peter. He says, the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the devil is loose, church. I don't know if you knew it or not, but the devil is loose. And he's going to come at you. Doesn't mean you haven't prayed. Doesn't mean you haven't read your Bible. We're just, at, we're, please understand, we are pilgrims walking through this land. In fact, the Bible says we are aliens walking through hostile territory. And things are going to come at you. And this is not being negative. This is trying to prepare you. Bring, being prepared prepares you for when the enemy brings something at you, at least you know I was expecting you. Because he's, he's walking through the earth looking for an opportunity to come at you. Who's rubbing you the wrong way? I know it's in this room. Right now, you, you have image, whether it's a child or a parent, co-worker or a church member. And we, we're running from these things, not realizing it's a part of the sharpening process. The pressure that you're experiencing. The friction that you're experiencing. And you're thinking that God has forgotten about me. No, God hasn't forgotten about you, brother and sister. God is... He's sharpening you. I look back on some of the things that broke my heart by people, and I almost want to send them a thank you card. Thank you for making me pray more. <laughs> thank you for making me watch the words of my mouth are you understanding and see because most of the time we think of the sharpening process oh this is going to be wonderful this is going to be so nice and cool God is cool cool God <laughs> okay we're going to put you in the furnace and heat it up seven times hotter Okay, we're going to put you in the, in the lion's den with some hungry lions. Okay, we're going to put you in a boat, and then in the middle of the ocean, a, a storm's going to come. We're going to see whether you're just saying it or you actually believe in what you say it. Look with me, if you will, uh, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, Lord have mercy. It's, okay, we're going to see how far we can go. Who's rubbing you the wrong way? <laughs> God is going to send into your life, I like to call them, iron sharpeners. <laughs> you know, my wife, 
Uh, she has the pencil sharpener that she has when she, you know, does her mascara and she puts it in there. And is that a pencil sharpener? What's that thing you? It's a pencil sharpener. See, I don't wear it, so I don't know. But you know, when she wants to get the eyeliner pencil, she puts it in there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So why y'all laugh then? So, you know, she, when it loses its edge, she puts it in there, that pencil sharpener, and, you know, she turns it in. She, it's funny how when she puts it in there, she puts pressure to the blade, and some of it comes off as she puts pressure on it so she can get to the point. I want to be an iron sharpener. You get around me, you're going to lose stuff. I'm going to put pressure and friction on you. Like right now, this word is putting pressure on you. When God says live right, you think, ooh. When God says you got to stop clubbing and start churching, ooh. <laughs> Genesis chapter 37. God will use people to sharpen you. I said, God will use people to sharpen you. Now understand what this does is at the same time the blade is getting sharper, I'm losing a little bit of it. And if you're not willing to lose a little bit of you as you get closer to God, you're going to have a hard time getting sharper. That means your, your funky attitude has got to go. Tell your neighbor, you got to change your attitude. Your attitude stinks. See, some of our attitude is stronger than cologne. Tell your neighbor again, you need to change your attitude. I can smell it. I can smell your attitude. I can smell your attitude. Smell your attitude. I know they want to move right now, but tell them again, you got to change your attitude. I can smell your attitude. Here's the thing you need to understand about your attitude. Your attitude, number one, is a choice. Number two, your attitude is either an, it attracts or it repels. Your attitude either attracts or repels. Now you ask, no, don't ask you, ask the people around you, how's my attitude? Now don't get around those people that are going to kiss up to you. Be around people that's going to be honest with you. Ask your neighbor sitting beside you, how's my attitude? Wait for an answer, wait for an answer. Wait for an answer, wait for an answer. <laughs> now I know some of you got threatened. <laughs> and I know some of you won't be going to lunch this afternoon, but it's okay. <laughs> Who's rubbing you the wrong way? God will use people. To sharpen you. I want to be around people that sharpen me. And I'm going to tell you something. If you are not correctable, then you can't be sharpened. It's important that you be around people that can correct you. Thank you, Lord. Who correct you and at the same time respect you. Because you don't want to be corrected by disrespectful people. We have to be so careful of just running with people that always pat us on the back and sing our praises. You will find that your greatest level of growth will not just come from being in a classroom, but it'll be through some of your life experiences. And some of those life experiences will be of your making, and some of them will be tailor-made by God that you don't understand. And the main thing is, is when you go through those times of, of sharpening, when you go through those times of refining, when you go through those times of purging, that you keep your heart in the right place. Because as much as we know about God, there's a lot we don't know. And we've got to be honest with ourselves and say, God, I didn't even know that was you.
There's been times in my life that I thought it wasn't God and it was him the whole time. And I can tell you that at the beginning of this service, the Spirit of God was speaking very clearly and distinctly in regard to some things about thinking that you lost some things when in actuality God was removing some things for your future. You have to make sure that in this process, this has got to match this. It's got to match this. And sometimes there are things that you're going to experience, like this here is so sharp right now, I can cut through this here cloth if I wanted to. It's that sharp. Even though this might be an obstacle, I can cut through it. But see, if I try it with this, I'm going to damage the blade. So I can't use this on something that it's not designed for. And you've got to know the people that God has assigned to your life that are there to help you to go to the next level. And even though it might be difficult and it might be hard on your flesh, you've got to understand that there are people that God has assigned to your life to help you to get to the next level. And sometimes when they're helping you, it doesn't look like they were assigned to you. And you see this in the life of Joseph. Joseph was born into a family with brothers, and, and, and the, the ones that seemingly were rubbing him the wrong way was his brothers in his same household. And I want to pick up here and do some reading. I know I'm not going to get through it today, all of it, but I do want to highlight some things that I believe will be beneficial to you so that you can see this scripture text in a whole different light, that God will use people sometimes that maybe don't look like it, but they are the sharpeners that God will use to bring you to a place of getting your edge back. Look at verse 1. I'm reading from the NLT. So Jacob settled in the land, in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as for as a foreigner this is the account of Jacob and his family when Joseph was 17 years old he often tended to his father's flock he worked for his half brothers and he goes on to say but Joseph reported back to his father some of the bad things his brothers was doing Joseph was a tattletale <laughs> Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph was born to him what had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because his father loved him more than the rest of them. Parents, you have to be so careful not to show partiality towards your children. What we see here in the scripture text is an example of a blended family. And in the midst of a blended family, the father started showing partiality and it caused division in the family. There's so much we can learn from this. It goes on to say here in verse 4, but his brothers hated Joseph because his father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. You ever have family members like that? Every time they talk about you, ain't nothing kind they got to say? Yeah, he's a problem child. Yeah, he was the one stealing stuff out of the refrigerator in the middle of the night problem child. They said they could say nothing kind about it. One night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listening to his dream, he said, we were in a field and, and you guys bowed down to me. I'm just paraphrasing some things here. And uh, so, so the father sent Joseph to go check on his brothers. Jacob uh, sent Joseph to go check on his brothers. And picking up in verse 18, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in a distance. As he approached, they made a plan to kill him. Do you know some people know about you before you think they know about you? And some people don't like you, but I'm here to tell you, even those people that don't like you, God can use them. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the uh, wells, and we can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what, we, what becomes of his dream. But when Reuben heard of, of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him in one of the empty wells uh, here in the, in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brother stripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the well. Now the well was empty and there was no water in it. 
Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of Campbell, a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of uh, Ishmaelites, tra uh, traders, taking a load of gum, balm, and uh, aromic uh, reason from Gilgad, Gilead to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We have to cover up the crime. Notice what they said, we've got to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. It doesn't look like it, but this is a part of God's plan for Joseph. And sometimes you can go through family crisis. Sometimes you can be put up for adoption. Sometimes your family can treat you as if you're not a part of the family. And it, it's hurtful and it's painful. But I want you to understand, even when you go through times like that, It's a sharpening taking place. Because see, sometimes we think that we're only being sharpened by good things happening to us. And I'm here to tell you that if you will keep your heart right when you're going through a difficult time, maybe they broke your heart, maybe they turned their back on you, maybe they took money from you, and, and now they're denying it, and you help them. All of those things look like they have nothing to do with your future. Your heart was broken. You were left for dead. They threw you in a dry place, hoping that nothing would become of your life. They broke your heart and walked away, and now they're happy-go-lucky, and you're dealing with the residue of, of being in a pit. It didn't look like it, but when those traders came by, an air lifted him to a different location. It was all a part of the sharpening process. Painful? Absolutely. Now think about Joseph. You talk about somebody losing their childhood. You talk about somebody not being there for Christmas and Thanksgiving. You talk about somebody not having a birthday because now you're being relocated. And all of this is setting Joseph up for what God has for him. Notice what happened here uh, in verse 29. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the well. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in, his, in, in, in the blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with the message, look at what we found. Didn't this robe belong to your son? To me, it's interesting. They didn't say, didn't this robe belong to your brother? They said, didn't it belong to your son? Have you ever felt like you were on the outside of the family even though you were part of the family? Their father recognized immediately, yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him, and Joseph had clearly been torn to pieces. So we look at verse 30, that chapter there, chapter 37, and then we pick up where Joseph is transported and relocated. Imagine going to a place that you don't know the language. Imagine going to a place that people don't know you. Imagine being a stranger in a different place, and sometimes life can be like that. And you're wondering, God, what's going on? What is my purpose? Why am I here? What's going on? God, my life is in chaos. My parents have divorced. Now nobody wants me. I've got to live with my grandparents. And now I don't know what's going on with my life. What's going to become of my life? I don't even have a history. That was Joseph. That was Joseph. And we pick up the life of Joseph in chapter 39. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar, get this, Potiphar was what? Potiphar was captain of the guards for Pharaoh. What's happening? He's being set up. He's being groomed. He's being sharpened. Imagine being in a place that you've never been before. Imagine being in a culture that you don't know the language. You don't look the same because these were Egyptians. Joseph, he was Jewish, Israelite. He dressed differently. And sometimes you go through these phases and changes in life, especially when it deals with your family. God is setting Joseph up. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is setting you up. No, tell him again, God is setting you up. 
Potiphar was captain of the guards for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Notice the connection. Joseph has no idea who bought him. Joseph had no idea who Potiphar is. He has no idea who he's connected with. All he knows is I've been relocated into a culture that I've never been in before. It might be your job, totally different culture. It might be in this church, totally different culture. And you think, where do I fit in here? Just keep your feet planted and let God groom you for what he has for you. Now notice this says in verse 2, here's the thing you never want to forget. That when you've been lied on, when you've been considered dead, when you've been relocated, when you've been put in another culture, this is the thing I want you to never forget. The Lord was with Joseph. Turn to your neighbor and say, the Lord is with you. you. No, you've got to be a little bit more emphatic. They need to know the Lord is with you. you. See, the same way that God had all these things happening to Joseph, Joseph realized that God was with him. And a lot of things have happened in your life. Some of them have been favorable. Some of them have not been favorable. You need to always remind yourself that in spite of what I've been through, in spite of what I'm going through, in spite of who sold me out, in spite of who relocated me, God is with me. I said, God is with me. And you need to be convinced of that as a child of God, that when things change and it seems hard, it seems difficult, you've been disappointed, your heart's been broken, people have walked away, people have used you, understand that God has not left you. God was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the house of his Egyptian master. Don't miss that. Egypt represents the world and it represents sin. But notice what Joseph is doing in the midst of that. He's serving. And you might be working on a job that your employer doesn't give a flip about God. You go there and do the best job you could possibly do. Because there will be a distinction between you. Now notice, you got to understand, Joseph is the new kid on the block. He is the new person in the house. He is the new slave that's called to work. But, but, but his, his employer, I said his employer, recognized that there's something different about them. There's something different about them. Everybody else just shows up for a paycheck. But they show up on time. And see, church, we can learn from this because in the sharpening process, sure, people did you wrong, but you can't wear your hurt on your sleeve all the time. It can't be the center of your conversation every time you have a conversation. You go out to lunch, you talk about your hurt. You go out to dinner, you talk about your hurt. You have Christmas, you talk about your hurt. You cut in the turkey, talking about your hurt. Listen, there comes a time you got to leave your hurt and bury it in the dirt. He served. Say he served. He served served in the house of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed. Potiphar noticed. And realized that the Lord was with Joseph. Hmm. Here's an ungodly man. Because the Egyptians worship Pharaoh. But he recognized something in Joseph. Joseph. What did he recognize? Let's keep reading. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. How did he notice it? Giving him success in everything he what? Everything he what? Everything he what? If you are going to be working in the world for people who don't know God, you need to go in there and do your job and not preach. You don't need to leave tracks in the kitchen. You don't don't have to go there and sit and read your Bible. Go there and work. Turn to your neighbor. Come on, turn to your neighbor. I'll come down there and turn you. (laughs) Say, when you go to work, work. 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 
Don't watch the clock. Don't watch the clock. Work. Work. Don't preach. Don't preach. Work. Work. Don't witness. Don't witness. Oh, I just messed up the religious people right there. <laughs> Work. Work. We don't need you walking down the hall praying in tongues. Work. Now, see, most religious people say, well, I can't believe he said don't witness on the job. That ain't why they're paying you, brother. That's not why they're paying you. Do you know you can witness without opening your mouth? Just go there and work. You know how you witness to them? Show up on time. I'll never forget it, man. I'll never forget it. our first house. <clears throat> You remember this, don't you? Our first house. We had a Christian realtor. And uh, she's supposed to show our house at a certain time. And uh, so we go there. We at the house. Wondering why she ain't show up. Thinking, why isn't she showing up? She knew. She knew she was supposed to be at a certain time. The individual was supposed to be at a certain time. And she came late, like an hour late. The individual. Realtor. Came an hour late. She said, what happened? She said, oh, we had a church service. She said, the Holy Ghost came in that service. <laughs> Guess what? Fired her. We fired her. I know I'm messing with religious people right now. But we come in there, yeah, the, I, I tell you, I was praying for the business. I was, that's, why, that's why I was late. I didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> Show up on time. Be there on time. Don't get there at 9 o'clock and look at the watch and say, what time is lunch? See, right now, you're acting like one of these, see? You're not being sharpened. When you are called on a job and you sign up for that job, you need to read what their requirements are. Amen. And for most part, from what I've seen, most jobs don't say we have a prayer meeting at 12 o'clock. No. And see, for the deep religious people, they probably get offended by what I'm saying when I say these things. But you go in the bathroom and you in there for two hours praying and using the bathroom as a cover. When you come out of the bathroom, you probably going to need to go back in there to get tissues because you're going to get fired. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? I want you to see that the Bible says Joseph served in his house and his master saw that what he did. Let me tell you something. The greatest witness that you can be on your job is to do your job with excellence, be on time, don't get caught up in the office grapevine, and thank the employer for even hiring you. See, we want the blessings of Joseph, but we're not willing to do what Joseph did. I, I'll stop here in a minute or two, because I know we're watching our clocks. Okay, let's, let, but... Verse 3, Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. That's called promotion. He put him in charge of his entire house. He put him in charge of what? His entire house. Now, you have to understand, he's a new employee. So how do you think the other employees felt? I mean, he's a slave from a different culture, and he gets put in charge of everything. How do you think they felt about it? Do you think they were exci excited about it? Do you think they were happy for him? They bring somebody in who don't look like us and don't speak like us because Joseph didn't know the language. Are you following me? Joseph didn't look like them. He's, he's, he's an Israelite. These are Egyptians. They don't even dress the same. So here you have, so I, we got an outsider over top of us. And notice what happens here. From the day that Joseph, verse 5, from the day that Joseph was put in charge of his master's household, 
the pro and the property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. And his household affairs ran smoothly. That's how God, you can know God's with you. You go into work and there's always a bunch of mess and drama going on and things aren't going smoothly, then brothers and sisters, you're dealing with a bunch of blockheads. You can tell when God's with you, things go smoothly, what happened? And his crops and livestock flourished. So there should be an increase and there should be a smoothness in operation when you show up. When you show up on the job, I don't care how much drama is there. I don't care how much chaos is there. I don't care how much office grapevine is there. When you show up, you should not be a part of that mess. Things should be going smoothly and things should be going flourishing. And even people that don't know God will notice. Joseph ain't said one thing about God to Potiphar. He let his work do his speaking instead of his mouth. And so many times we want to go in and tell people how good God is. No, show them how good God is by going in and doing the work. All his household affairs ran smoothly. Now that means that Joseph was new, but he got along with the people who didn't know him. I hope you're getting this, man, because this is all a part of iron sharpening iron, and sometimes we have this one-track mind that this is the way it's got to be, and not realize that sometimes the challenges, the difficulty, and the new things that we have to encounter, God is trying to sharpen you for a greater purpose, but we're resisting and saying, well, that's hard, it can't be God. Sometimes you are being challenged. Sometimes you are going to face difficulty. Sometimes things are going to be tight. But child of God, you understand you're not trying to do it in your strength. You're doing it in the ability that God gives you, and you're doing it with the wisdom that he gives you. But if you don't spend time with him, you're going to have breakdown. You're going to say, I can't take it. You're going to say, this is too much. You're going to say, this is not fair. Child of God, the world is not fair. We're not of this world. We've got to depend on God to strengthen us. We've got to depend on him to help us. And when the world is breaking down, we should be standing up. Sometimes we're too soft. We talk strong in church, but weak on the job. The same God that shows up at the altar is the same God that will be with you. But the problem is, is we're not preparing to go into work. We're trying to prepare when we get into work. Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. Are you seeing verse 6? He gave him complete administrative uh, uh, responsibility over everything. Somebody say everything. everything. Over everything. That means every slave is under Joseph's care. Every piece of cattle, every piece of property, every piece of furniture is under Joseph's care, and he's the new kid on the block. Why? Because he didn't let what happened in his house get into his heart. Are you hearing me? He had stuff happen in his family, in his house, that could have gotten his heart and made Joseph a bitter person. And everybody he gets around, you can tell when people got stuff in their heart, because every time they get around people, they throw up on them. Got a new job, yeah, I tell you what, but they hurt me on that last one. They were just mean. I'm telling you, they were just mean. They treated me wrong. I didn't get my pension telling you, I hope that company fail. You just threw up on them. Can you stand just a little bit more? I don't think you can. Stand with me. You know why things are so hard for you? Because your blade's dull. Your blade's dull. Your blade's so dull you can't even cut through butter. Your blade's dull. You don't want any pressure, any friction, 
You get a little bit of friction, you run. You don't fight, you take flight. A little bit of pressure. A little bit, little, little bit of friction. I'm out of here. I ain't got to put up with this. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can, be, you, can be a butter, you can be a butter knife if you want. You can be a butter knife. You, you, got, you got purpose for one thing, butter. But when you get into the meat of the word, you need a knife. <clears throat> Some people are so shallow. It's amazing to me. Back in the day when you were on the streets, somebody step on your shoes, you'd be ready to fight. Somebody step on your shoe in church, you're ready to leave the church. I'm done here. I can't tell you. I, they, 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 they took my seat. I, I, that's my seat. I, I, I'm not moving. I don't know about you. But I'm done with talking about the next level. I'm serious. I'm done with talking about the next level. I'm ready to take some steps to the next level. And see, but see, see, I, I'm trying to get you out of a church mindset. Because you church, talk to most church folk, what are you doing? I'm going to the next level. What's that look like? I'm telling you it's higher. What's that look like? See, we've used church jargon at the expense of, 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 of not moving anywhere. Because <laughs> we've mastered the conversation, we've, we've mastered the vernacular, but we haven't stretched ourselves to do it. Last thing people want to do is be stretched. You don't think so? I ain't going to ask the last time you've been to the gym. Because I'm guilty too. But nobody wants to be stretched. If you're not stretched, you'll never know your potential. You'll never know your potential. I'm done talking about the next level. I'm taking the steps to go to the next level. And going to the next level for some will be like Joseph, learning a new language. You can't talk Ebonics on this level. You can't talk hood on this level. Hood is not good on this level. You understand what I'm saying to you? You can't even wear your clothes the way you used to. Do you understand that when Joseph was in jail for two years, the, 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 the baker and the cupbearer, the baker got killed, he got his head cut off. The cupbearer said he remembered after two years Joseph was in prison. He said, I remember somebody who told me my dream. The Bible says when Potiphar's, I mean when Pharaoh sent for Potiphar, I mean when Pharaoh sent for Joseph to interpret his dream, the Bible says Joseph changed his clothes and he shaved. That means he didn't come with his pants hanging off of his butt. He didn't come with his beard looking like he just rolled out of bed. He came manicured and ready for a position he wasn't qualified for. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? He came prepared to step into a position that he wasn't even qualified for. All he had was a relationship with God that prepared him for the next level. So my question to you today is, are you ready? Now don't listen before you answer, because I know church folks, amen, I want you to listen. Are you ready for the next level, and what steps are you taking? Are you ready for the next level, and what steps are you taking? Because if the next level wants to open up for you tomorrow, then are, do you already have the wardrobe or do you have to go find one? Have you acquainted yourself with next level living? Because on the, on the, on the, the penthouse, the air is a little different. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Air is a little different. Conversation is a little different. Are you ready for that? And don't, you don't have to answer me now. I want you to think about it. What does your next step look like to your next level? 
Because I can tell you, a lot of you aren't prepared for it. You've learned church vernacular, but you haven't switched over to understand how to deal with the culture. Father, in the name of Jesus, lift your hands to heaven if you will with me. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes, open our ears, and shift our thinking. Father, I know in this room that there is a sharpening process going on. For some, it's not pleasant. For some, they're excited about it. Father, may we hang around sharpeners. People that will challenge us. People that will stretch us. People that will educate us. And people who will show us. May our hearts be pure like Joseph. In spite of everything he went through, Father, he kept his heart pure. He kept his heart in the right place. And Father, there are people here who have been through hell, literally walked through hell, mentally and emotionally and physically. And Father, may what they've been through not get in their hearts. This week, Father, show us how we need to prepare ourselves for what you have for us. Father, the rough edges that we have on us, Holy Spirit, we give you permission to take them off. Sharpen us so that we can cut through depression so that we can cut through the fear that has kept us grounded. Fear is a deadly thing. It'll keep you grounded when you should be soaring. Father, may we cut through the fear. And may we do things that our fear restricted us from doing. I break every mental block every mental pattern that has kept us in bondage. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to loose their minds. Loose their minds. Not just talk, but loose their minds and loose their emotions from the bondage of fear. And Father, may we do what we were afraid to do. And become what we were created to be. In the name of Jesus. Father, I declare over your people the 91st Psalm. That Father, we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And under the shadow of the Almighty do we abide. We declare that no evil shall befall us. And neither shall any plague come near our dwelling. Father, because you are our shepherd, Father, we don't have to want. For you lead us, guide us, direct us, and protect us. And God, this week, may we study the life of Joseph and do what he did. Walk how he walked in this season of our life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I got to tell you, I didn't go into it. But in this new place, temptation is going to come from unexpected places. Just like with Joseph. The temptation for Joseph came in his workplace. On your job, be careful. Guard your heart. Because what happened with Joseph was somebody was watching him and he didn't know it. I said somebody was watching him on the job and he didn't know it. She got enough courage to say, come lie with me. In fact, she set him up. She put everybody out. Now here she is telling the employees what to do and she's not in charge. I mean, didn't it say he was in charge of everything? 
Potiphar's wife wasn't happy with Potiphar's decision because Joseph's in charge of everything. Even Potiphar's food. Wives, don't you like to know what's going on with your husband's food? How would you like for the maid to come in and take that over? No, think about what I'm saying to you. See, we read this and I don't know if we fully comprehend. A strange person came in and now is dictating to your husband what he's going to eat and you the wife. Be careful on your job. Sometimes the people you think like you are setting you up. And you got to be able to discern the difference. They like you, but they also want to replace you. Okay, I'll let you go. Have a good day, y'all. Blessings of God be on you, and have a great day, and we'll see you soon.